another edition to the Point Podcast. Everybody's doing well on this Wednesday, and we have a lot to get into today. Uh, some interesting news from around the NHL yesterday. Australian Open firing. We got uh, a firing in Las Vegas when it comes to the NFL. Uh, GM Mike Mayock is out. Uh, start to talk about the divisional playoff games. Uh, I'll do, be doing a podcast with Matt Wright on Friday to preview those games, kind of give our thoughts on who we see coming out on top of those ones. And, uh, you know, among some other things in the world of football. Um, but today, you know, there's a lot of different things happening, but I, I think we saw something really unique uh, yesterday in the NHL and I wanted to talk about it. And for decades, for generations, you could argue the Montreal Canadiens have had one philosophy and that is that their general manager is French. And that's been a constant. Uh, Marc Bergevin could speak French. You, you go through Guy Carboneau, uh, head coaches, general managers were fluent in speaking both English and French, which just to start off, there's nothing wrong with that. But by boxing yourself in, you limit your candidates. And in my opinion, you hurt your overall product because again, I'm not a Montreal Canadiens fan. I'm not a fan of any team, but I just can speak from pure logic. I would rather win a Stanley cup with a guy that speaks Russian than a guy who can speak English or French or whatever language is predominant in that area. So I looked at how they went about this and they hire a president, which basically they hired Jeff Gordon, who was in New York, who I think deserves a lot of the credit for the turnaround that this team has had. Chris Jury uh, stepped into a really good situation when they let go of Gordon and uh, head coach David Quinn, but it was who was the GM at the time? It was Gordon. He brought in Shesterkin. He traded for Mika Zibanejad. He, he uh, signed Artemi Panarin, luring him uh, from Columbus. So he made a lot of these foundational moves that you see now the New York Rangers are a, a contender for a Stanley Cup. However, Jeff Gordon is as English as anybody you know. He, he tried to speak French in his opening press conference. It was cringeworthy. It was bad you know it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, fluently bilingual i'll tell you that rds would not be finding the clip and being like oh, jeff gordon's great he's speaking french that's not how it went down and you know my instant thought is well the montreal canadians will hire a very fluent a a very french general manager and we go through the process. You think they might hire a few guys in uh, Tampa Bay who are, who are French speaking because their GM, Julian Brisois, is um, his French is his first language. Then you have, well, maybe they hire Patrick Waugh, which never was going to happen, but it got the media ran with that story for five minutes so they could get their little spiel about it. But you knew Patrick Waugh was never going to Montreal, at least not with Jeff Gordon at the helm. So I'm thinking, well, who's it going to be? It's going to be Matthew Darsh or it's going to be somebody like that. But they go and they hire Kent Hughes, who is a player agent. You know, he had represented Patrice Bergeron. He had represented uh, Brad Marchand. And Kent Hughes does speak French. But you just hear the name Kent Hughes. It sounds like he's from Boise, Idaho. It sounds like he's from Rhode Island, Kent Hughes. It's not exactly... You know, you think of uh, Kent Johnson. No, this is Kent Hughes. And what I see the shift here is he does speak French, but is his first language French? No. Well, Michel Terrier, Dominic Ducharme, Marc Bergevin, they all spoke French as their first, first language. That was, if they wanted to have a conversation with somebody and they wanted to have the best possible conversation, French was their preferred language. Neither Jeff Gordon and neither Ken Hughes's first choice would be to parlay, pardon the pun, with anyone other than English. French is secondary. That is a, excuse me, he, a systematic change to how they do business. And I'm starting to, to wonder 
I don't think Dominic Ducharme is going to be back next year. Jeff Gordon's going to want to hire his own coach. That's how GMs work. You fire him. You bring in the guy you want to run your team. Well, will the head coach be French? I have my doubts. Andre Turney's already been hired. He speaks French. He's in Arizona for him, but he's down there. Do they hire uh, uh, Bo Gru's father, who's coaching the Syracuse Crunch? He's French. I think he's a good coach, but is he worthy of a head coaching job yet in the NHL? That remains to be seen. But if I had my guess, the head coach is not going to be you know, the real systematic change, the real bucking the trend, if you will, will be if they hire an English speaking head coach, because Kurt Muller was there on an interim basis and he was English speaking. He didn't last long there. And first of all, again, I just want to make this point. It's not right or wrong that you hire someone French or English. If it's just, if, is he the right candidate? Is he the right person for the job? And if I'm looking at Montreal, they have some options here. Are they going to completely blow it up? I wouldn't advise that. I think they have pieces that they could be a team that competes for a playoff spot next season. If you get Carey Price back, if you get Suzuki, it, I, I like Suzuki a lot. Caulfield obviously is having a tough season. He's going to have to really find his confidence again. But if they keep Petrie on the roster, they need to make some moves, no doubt about it. But can they be better next season? Can they compete? I believe they can. They have building blocks to do it. They're still searching for a number one center. That continued to elude them, but that's been a almost two-decade problem for the Montreal Canadiens. But what's what do they have? They have a foundational piece that most organizations kill for most organizations will search high and wide to find it. And that's a goaltender. It's rare that you find an organization like the New York Rangers who can go from Henrik Lundqvist to Igor Shesterkin. It doesn't happen that way. It takes organizations years and years to find a goalie. Since Ryan Miller, the Buffalo Sabres have been in complete turmoil. They haven't had stability at that position since Ryan Miller. He hasn't played there in a very long time. You look at Detroit. They were a great team. But what did they have stability? They had Chris Osgood and they had Dominic Hasek. That's a pretty damn good tandem. And a pretty good, you go from him to him. Since then, it's been a revolving door. Jonathan Bernier, Alex Nadolkovich. I like Nadolkovich. Maybe he could be the answer. But... For a long time, it was Jimmy Howard or bust. Well, it's only going to be a bust with him. But I'm just making the point. You can have a great team. The Colorado Avalanche, I still say they should have won the Stanley Cup last season. But they didn't have goaltending. They haven't the last two years when they were really, really good. And when you find that position, when you have that strength, you can't just say, okay, we're going to blow it up because then the goalie will want out of there. Montreal's in a position where if Carey Price come back healthy, if he's okay upstairs in the brain, they can compete for a playoff spot. They can be a team that can be threatening because they have that foundational building block. But what is also really compelling about this is Jeff Gordon's going to watch this whole season. He's he'll, you know, he'll see players he likes, doesn't like, They'll go. I think Ben Sherratt will likely get traded at the trade deadline. He's a, I really like him. Um, I mentioned to a few friends the other day, uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, they don't get a lot to trade. They don't get a lot of draft picks, but I'd want Ben Sherratt because Ben Sherratt is a better player than Jake Muzzin right now. And they're, they're very similar, but Ben Sherratt is much more stable defensively than Jake Muzzin. And I would, I would rather take Ben Sherratt. And I take him on my team and put him on, on a lesser pair if you need to. But he's a guy that he played fantastic in the playoffs last year. He can go up against the other team's top line and do it night in, night out. He, him and Shea Weber uh, did a pretty good job against Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner in games five, six, and seven, if you recall. 
But what will be interesting is to me also is the media aspect. And, you know, a lot of people say Toronto's the toughest media market in the NHL. And I disagree because Toronto is tough when they lose, but that's for a day. And then they get over it. And Leafs fans are so forgiving and they're so loyal. So it can only be, you can only take such a slap. Leafs fans are never going to give up on their team because they would have 50 years ago. And the media is the same. A lot the media in Toronto are, let's just be honest here, ladies and gents, fans of the Toronto Maple Leafs. They have personal relationships with some of the players. They talk to them every day. And it's this doesn't just happen in Toronto. Watch a Nessing game. Again, I watched Boston Carolina last night. I had the game on mute for a reason because I can't listen to Jack Edwards. Most local calls are like this. And part of the problem in Toronto is there's so many scribes. You know, there's so many writers, so many reporters that it makes it seem like such a daunting feat. But to me, it's Montreal because you have the push from English and French and no other market has this. You have pressure from two, you have, say your TSN reporter, you have your Sportsnet, you have your Gazette, whatever, but then you have RDS and you have people asking you questions in French. That can be daunting. So, and Montreal Canadiens are not like Toronto. Toronto fans will show up to the rink when they're out of the playoffs. They've done it. They did it when they went through their long, you know, uh, heartbreaking years when they're tanking. Montreal fans won't show up. They'll boo them. They'll throw stuff on the, they, they're passionate, but when they're not winning, it's passionate in a very negative sense. And it's, we're not happy. We're going to let you know about it. So my interest here is, well, if they hire an English speaking coach, how is he going to be received by the media? How is his opening presser going to be? You know, there's going to be the question that says, well, uh, could you answer me in French? And maybe it won't happen. Maybe it will be a uh, French speaking. Heck, maybe they keep Dom Ducharme. Again, I doubt it because you look at the way they played for him this year. He just doesn't seem to be getting the locker room. They don't seem to be uh, picking up his vibe. But I think this is going to be fascinating. Down, down the stretch here, what they do with the trade deadline. I mean, the team stinks, so they're going to move some move some pieces despite winning last night. But also, what, you know, where do we go? What does Jeff Gordon decide to do? He's got his GM. Is he going to start looking for coaches? Dom Ducharme, dead man walking. Um, we'll see because I see this one very interesting. and. I don't know what Montreal is going to say. I don't know what they're going to do with Ken Hughes. I mean, Ken Hughes is an interesting hire in and of itself. I mean, the last player agent that's really a prominent one that comes to mind for me is Brody Van Wagenen. And he was the uh, GM of the New York Mets. He only lasted two seasons, both of them missing the playoffs. And uh, his big claim to fame was that he used to be the player agent for Tim Tebow. Um you know how I feel about Tim Tebow. So that, that the fact that that's your claim to fame, that you got him playing single A ball. Good for you. Uh, but nobody else cares, uh, including the Mets who then cut him. So we'll see what happens. But this is an interesting situation for me in Montreal because I, I want to see how they go about it. If this is a systematic change, because what do we... You can say that they got to a Stanley Cup final last year. You can't take that away from them. And they earned getting there. But Mark Bergevin, it, it, was, it was a miracle run. It was a, they found a way they got there. Most people would say it wouldn't, it's not going to happen again with this group of players, which I happen to agree with. So you look through it. Last season was standing. They made a conference final. They have made the playoffs and floundered. They missed the playoffs terribly a few years. And all it leaves you with is we haven't won a Stanley Cup since 1993. Now, that's not a long joke compared to some organizations. But when you're the Montreal Canadiens, when you're a prominent team, that's a long-ass drought. Especially when small market teams like Tampa and 
Pittsburgh are winning multiple in a decade. And you're left standing there doing nothing during that time. You, you didn't get close. I mean, the best much after last season, the, the next best thing the Montreal Canadiens can say is, well, we would have won the Stanley Cup if Chris Kreider didn't run into – no, you wouldn't have. Nobody was beating L.A. in 2014. But that's what we want to hold on to. Good for you. But we'll see what happens down the stretch here. I think it's going to be really, really fun to watch um, to see what happens uh, down the road here with the Montreal Canadiens. One big rival of the Montreal Canadiens is the uh, – it's the Boston Bruins. And, you know, it's important to talk about what they did last night. And they retired the, the number of the first black player to play in the NHL. And that would be Willie O'Ree. And Willie O'Ree, you know, retiring his number is less to do about what he did on the ice when it comes to his play. But more of what he's done off the ice. More of, you know, stepping onto the ice for the first time, being a, a black, being a, you know, being di- a minority in a game, being the first one to cross that color line, if you will. And also what he's done for the game of hockey since inspiring young black players like Wayne Simmons, like Ryan Reeves. You know, we've seen them all before the game last night, JT Brown, who's now a color analyst for the Seattle Kraken, you know, to, to get in the game for, for, for the, uh, for the black community to embrace the game of hockey, to, to choose to play this. And you're starting to see some great, you know, great players, Jordan Greenway, another one that comes to mind. And I just think it's so important because, you know, we, we recognize Jackie Robinson and he deserves all the accolades, all the applause for what he did. And obviously you can't talk about um, Jackie Robinson without talking about Branch Rickey, who was the manager of the then Brooklyn Dodgers, who got Jackie Robinson to play baseball in the majors. And it was a a seismic shift where he said, I want Jackie. I want a black player to play a white man's game. And if you don't have those allies, if you don't have those people to, to get you to get the, the people that are pushed aside that would never have this chance to get in the door, then there is no great athletes. There is no, you know, you hear about back in the old days of football in NCAA, the old coach, Bear Bryant, he saw black players playing and he said, I need these guys at Alabama. And he started recruiting them to come to, you think about Alabama, not the most, not the state that you'd say would be the most uh, accepting of, of African-Americans, of minorities. But it takes a hell of a lot of courage for these athletes, for guys like Willie O'Ree to step into an arena when he's completely alone. He's on an island. But you also you you have to um, applaud the people that do the right thing that say, you know, I I just want this guy to play because he's damn good. But so that was great. Willie O'Ree last night, long overdue. So good to see him get his number retired in Boston. Unfortunately for, for him, his Bruins really took a beating last night. They lose seven, one to the Carolina hurricanes. And, you know, last week, if you didn't listen to the podcast, I um, had um, Creighton Fillmore and Walker Campbell on, and we talked about the awards in the NHL. And, um, you know, we debated and we talked about Ovechkin and, other names on the list that we thought were, were interesting names. And, but we got to the Norris and it was really, you know, Kale McCarr was there, Victor Hedman, but normally McCarr was the, the, the obvious choice. Well, I watched that game basically start to finish last night. It was slipping between that and the Australian open. And, and then when Florida came on, but I, I look at Carolina and I say, damn, they're a good team. Because they're deep. Frederick Anderson's having a great year in net. They get two goals from Cock and Emmy last night. Seth Jarvis, the, the young 19-year-old, gets a goal. They have balance throughout their lineup, which is so important. But not only that, I think they have, 
I think McCarr will likely win it. But so far this season, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a more worthy, to find a more important defenseman than Jacob Slavin. And I know people have heard me talk about him before. And is he going to be Mr. Point Guy? Is he going to grab your attention every night? No. But you look at, I watched him last night, and I don't know how you don't lo- love his game. He, he finishes the game with three points. So very good night for him. Goal and two assists. But not only that, 7-1 game, plays in every situation, plays, only played 22-30 last night because that's all we need to play. They were winning 7-1. They didn't play anybody a whole lot of minutes. But he finishes the game with a plus four. So that's for all my dinosaurs out there, plus four, great game. But he's got 21 points in 34 games. But the guy just, you never see him make stupid decisions. And, you know, he had 36 points in 68 games. He had 15 and 52 last year, even though I felt he had a fantastic year. But he's got 21 and 34 already. Only two goals. He's not a guy that scores a ton of goals. But he is a great passer on the Terravine and first goal. Beautiful vision across the ice. But this is where the award gets, you know, I think Hedman should be nominated. No doubt about it. I think McCarr should be nominated at this point. Slavin should be number three for me. There's three guys nominated for the award. I think he could win it. Because is McCarr the most dynamic defenseman in the NHL? No doubt about it. But... In my opinion, Jacob Slavin is more valuable than Kale McCarr because Slavin is going to be a better player come playoff time than Kale McCarr. I just look at the game, how it's played. Defensively, in his own zone, he rarely, if he ever, makes a mistake. He's the most sound, he's one of the most sound players in the whole National Hockey League. He just doesn't make a mistake. He sees the puck. He gets the puck out of his own. He reads the play so well. He's so smart. That, that's what separates him from a lot of other players. It's just his knowledge, his hockey IQ. He just knows what to do at that certain time, and he always seems to make them have the right read. And I would argue that he's as valuable to his team as McCarr is to Colorado because Carolina doesn't have an Ethan McKinnon. Carolina does not have a Mikko Ratnan. They don't have a Gabriel Landeskog, but they have important guys. They have really important guys. Like, I think Sveshnikov really has a well-rounded game. He's really, really improved. Aho plays a 200-foot game. You know, I think he's plays the Matt Barzell game, but he can play it better because he has a, he's a stronger upper body. He And I think he's just a guy who gives a shit more into winning than, say, a, a Barzell. Aho will sacrifice points, sacrifice goals, you know, accolades, if you will, for the greater good. It doesn't hurt that, you know, Carolina has one of the best coaches in the NHL and Rob Brendamore. But I look at Slavin and I say, yes, he's surrounded by a very, very good defense corps. Brett Pesci is a very good defenseman. Ian Cole is an older guy, but he makes a smart pass more often than not. Ethan Bear was a great pickup. Tony D'Angelo has fit like a glove in Carolina. You don't hear any of the BS that you heard about in at, at Madison Square Garden. Well, I, I still, you need that, that engine. You need that, what keeps you going. Jacob Slavin is that guy. He's, you look at the game, you say, who are we going to rely on to make a smart defensive play? Who's going to block a shot? Who can we put out there to defend the lead and we can trust he's not going to F this up? It's Jacob Slavin. And the award is basically all based on points now, which I hate. But is he putting up? Otherworldly point totals. No, but let's just look up defenseman points because the guys that get a lot of points are not the guys that normally win Stanley Cups. You know, 
they, I mean, uh, Chris Tang is a, is, is an anomaly for me. Um, so we look this season, 30, uh, 41 games, Victor Hedman has 43 points. I mean, he's great. Roman Yossi has 40 in 39. He's having a great year. Fox has 39 and 39. Makar has 37 and 32. Ekblad, Chris Letang. So you have to go a long way. You know, Devin Taves has more points as his teammate. Morris Sider, another guy I love. Mackenzie Wieger's on this list at 20. Um, Miro Heiskanen, Lorenz, Jacob Slavin's 27. Tie with Alex Goligoski. But I look and I go, is Tori Krug more valuable than Jacob Slavin? Next question. Darlene, okay. I, I like Uyghur a lot. You know how much I, I like Florida. He's not. McAvoy, you're telling me Shane Goss's bear should be given more love than – and he would. That's the thing because he has more points. That's just how it works. Petrangelo and Theodore are great, but they're not as – Eric Carlson, I, I'm not even going to talk about this. Brent Burns – Morgan Riley, it's I I, I don't want to put people down here, but this is how I look. I I just don't see it. You know, I I, I see him, and I think he's as valuable as anybody on this list. In in my opinion, you know, Seth Jones is above him. I love Seth Jones. He plays twenty five minutes a game. That's a lot of minutes. He's very valuable. Slavin. Plays 23-54, which isn't as much, but he's to me, they wouldn't be half as good as they are without him. And I'll beat that drum. I doubt he'll be nominated because he's too far down on this list when it comes to points. And that's just the – if I look at the D point list, I will pull it up again. If I had to say who would be nominated right now, I'd say Hedman, McCarr, and Yossi. And – is Ro, you know, Roman Yossi, it makes sense. He's on a very good team. He is. Kale McCarr is on a very good team. Victor Hedman has won back-to-back -back Stanley Cups, and he, you know, he always seems to get nominated for the award. I have no problem with him getting nominated because he's damn good every year, almost every freaking night. But it's also looking at, okay, they're flashy. Maybe let's look at small market Carolina and how, how the hell is this team so consistent every year? Well, maybe the defenseman that has been there for a long time, a pillar, and the guy who's heard Rob Brendan Moore's voice for the longest time has a maybe has a big part of it. And to me, he does. So I just wanted to, you know, ring the bell for him. He deserves some kudos here um, for what he's done. Last night, the Florida Panthers lose, which is a, that's a big deal when they lose again. They lose to Calgary. Uh, Calgary, you know. Biggest deal for me in that game, they get two power play goals. And I, I haven't watched them in a while. They haven't played many games in a while. Johnny Goodrow had a, had a big night. He had four points. Kachuk uh, added uh, three himself. So that line was chugging last night. But if I, I took anything from the game, um, I'm not worried about Florida whatsoever. Um, but what I did like from Calgary is how they defended how um, I found in the neutral zone, they're always there to take away passes. You saw Majinapani, you saw Michael Backlin, uh, you know, uh, some really, some good defensive plays from these guys, Elias Lindholm, my guy. So they, I found they defend very well. And that's how Daryl Sutter plays, but they kind of got away from this. But Calgary, if they're going to make the playoffs, if they're going to be able to go on a decent run, and I have my doubts, obviously Markstrom has to be great. He's been very good this season. But create offense by playing good defense. And I think that is the Daryl Sutter philosophy is limit the opposing team's scoring chances. But if their wingers, if their forwards are committed to this, I mean, Markstrom only had 29 shots last night. If he's getting 29 a night, that's, that's really good. That's all you can ask for, um, in my opinion, as a player, because that, that's a pretty good ratio. You didn't. You're not giving up a lot if they're not high slot chances. That, that last night was a pretty easy night for Jacob Marstrom. But to me, you need Majinapani, Backlin, Lindholm, even Goodrow. Yes, you're not going to be Mr. Backcheck. You've ne you'll never be that guy. But 
in the neutral zone, you are a crafty guy. Steal a puck. You know, Kachuk, force some turnovers. That's the way you play the game and get to the net. So, and the biggest thing for Calgary is they play in a division that is so, so weak. You know, I mean, you look at it here, the standings in the Pacific division. Vegas is first. They played 40 games. They got 48 points. LA is second. They played 40 games. They have 45. Anaheim is third. They played 41 games. They have 45 points. San Jose is played 40 games. They have 44. Then you have Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, Calgary's got 42 points. So they're right in the thick of it. They have five games in hand on San Jose, LA, and Vegas. So they can easily make up ground. I do think Calgary is a better team at this point than LA, Anaheim, and San Jose, because I don't think any of those teams are particularly that great. I do think one of them could sneak into the playoffs, but we'll see what happens with, with, with Calgary moving forward here. But the real interesting, and I had to get to, to this today, I didn't leave with it because I, I found the Montreal interesting, but let's get to Edmonton because if you missed it yesterday, a uh, Ho hockey hall of fame reporter, Jim Matheson met with Leon Dreisaitl. Uh, and he started asking him some questions about, you know, their play lately. And if you didn't get to watch the game Saturday night where they lost to the Ottawa senators, where they had a three, one league going into the, third period and they lost six to four well that was just you know they won two of their last 10 mcdavid and dry side look absolutely dejected which i'm gonna add i don't blame them for having this feeling but i also think that their play has not been good lately they and this is where points come in you have to watch the game yes they you know dry settle got a point saturday night but it's about how you play. And this is John Tortorella's point and it's coming to fruition. And I don't hear anybody in the media bring this up. They're just, Oh, let's kill John Tortorella. Well, look at the Edmonton Oilers right now. They stink. And McDavid and dry saddle are a part of the problem. So do they back check? No. Do they make, do they turn the puck over in the offensive zone and it leads to goals on the other end? You bet. And part of being a really good player is knowing your team, knowing your surroundings. Well, for the Edmonton Oilers, for Connor McDavid, for Leon, Dry Leon Dreisaitl, you may trust each other, but you also have to look and say, in your head, you don't vocalize this, but say, our back end is really, really porous. Our goaltending Saturday, we had Stuart Skinner, not Jeff Skinner, Stuart in net. Maybe we need to protect the puck better. Maybe we need to be smarter, make better decisions. But that's never mentioned. It's always just, well, our depth stinks. And I'm not going to argue that point. Yes, your depth could be greatly improved. But at the same time, you're the superstars of this team. You get lauded for all the points. You're the one getting talked about for heart trophies and yada, yada, yada. Well, your team is in the gutter right now. And not sounding like you're going to help or, you know, getting, putting the two Leon Dreisel and Carmen David on their own island and pushing themselves away from this sinking ship is not the way you handle leadership, in my opinion. The best people I've been around, if you're in a situation, you're starting to lose games, it's not, well, I'm playing well and you don't, because that's an individualistic type of thing, you know. That's, it depends what business you're in. If you're in tennis, you can have that attitude because you just say, you know what, I bleep and suck. And maybe you'll blame your coaches and you go like that, but it doesn't usually work out, but you could have that opinion. But you're in a team environment. Two people do not win you anything. Aaron Rodgers would have more Super Bowls if it was just up to him because he's an unbelievable talent. But it takes a team. It takes cohesion. And I look at these two guys, and I'll, I'll think of McDavid right off the top. I don't see him as a great leader. I mentioned this from, from I mentioned this last week with Evander Kane. Evander Kane has been a guy that's just been giving away with stuff his whole career. You keep opening up the door a little bit more. The hinge keeps breaking, breaking, breaking. And eventually he just runs through it. You know, it's like giving a 14-year-old a kid 
you know, keys to the liquor store. They got the key in, they're twisting it, they're twisting it, like, oh, I really want to try. And eventually they get in there and they go crazy. And then it's throwing up. It's it's a terrible situation. That, that's what's happening here, in, in my opinion. It, it's not, it's not good. But with Evander Kane to that point, you have a leader that isn't very vocal. You have a leaker, leader right now who isn't with the team, in my opinion. He's not with the group. He's, you know, he's over here, and he's the other the team's here. He's sliding away. He's trying to get away from the blame, from the heap of shit that's getting rained down on the city of Edmonton right now, which I can understand in a way. But again, it comes back to you're playing a team sport. You're not playing golf. You're not playing tennis. Your only option is if I'm going to succeed, if I'm going to get anywhere anytime soon, it's going to be with this team. Because guess what, Connor? You're not getting moved. Guess what, Leon? You're not getting moved. And the majority of these journeyman guys are going to be on the team the rest of the season. So deal with it. And I don't see them doing that enough. It's just, it's deflection. It's, it's not my fault. Well, in life, sometimes you just have to own it. Sometimes you just have to, sometimes you just have to apologize, even when it's not your fault. Because guess what? You have to take the higher road. And it's tough. Believe me, I've had to do it before. I don't enjoy it. But it's something that you have to do. But we'll see. But I'll get back to dry cycle. So he's talking to Jim Matheson. And he looks dejected. And, you know, th this is a great, I, I, so I'll, I'll reveal what happened and then I'll talk about it. You know, he, you know, so Jim Madison, I'm just reading, he was covered the team since its inception in 1970, uh, 1973. And, you know, he, he got asked about, you know, Asking a currently bad team what they need to work on. Dry settle just wanted to, you know, just wanted to say, he said, we have to get better at everything, which is not an answer. And, you know, Matheson wanted more, which is a good report. That's not a good answer. So he said, he said, you know, Matheson basically asked, can you want to expand on that? And Dry Settle says, no, you can do that. You know everything. Kind of as a dig. And I'm okay with that answer uh, because. Lord knows I've written stuff before that I'm sure people don't like. But then the reporter then asked Dreisaitl, you know, why he has to be so pissy about it, which maybe it's not the best choice of words. But Dreisaitl basically said, I'm not, you know, and I'm just going to say this. Should Jim Matheson have said, you know, why he's so pissy? Probably not, but dry saddle was acting like a petulant child so i can understand where he's coming from but all i heard on on twitter over the last 24 hours was well matheson's in the wrong and dry saddle was right i disagree fundamentally i don't think dry saddle was right at all i don't think you reward negative you so basically you're saying i i accept petulance because lord knows i don't like media people all the time I talk about the ones I don't like on this show. Eric Engels, Montreal, don't like him. Uh, I won't go into everybody in Toronto I don't like because there's too many ass kissers. But Jack Edwards, already I mentioned another one on the podcast. I could go on. But I'm starting to like Troy Aikman more because he's starting to fire off with the Cowboys. Before, I just thought he was really just a homer. But um, I – you have a job and part of that job is to answer the media's questions. And guess what? It's not the media's fault that your team sucks. Let's just throw it all on the table here. It is not their fault that you, you've been stinking it up lately. They can't do anything about that. And when, when you stink, when your team is losing game after game and the media is not going to be writing puff pieces unless they, if they have a brain and let's also just remember this when you see anything an article negativity sells people like to read negative articles more than positive it's a definitive fact i learned about this at school and, and um 
it was something like 75% of people are more likely to read an entire article if it has a negative spin, if it has a, you know, if, it, if it's putting somebody down rather than a positive puff piece. I think, I, for instance, just myself, I'll read an article based on a politician that is, that is slamming the guy rather than talk about how great he is because who wants, nobody wants to read, okay, this guy's so great because of this, uh, yada, yada, yada. I'll read his obit. You know, <laughs> might sound a little dark, but I mean, that, that, that's what I'll do. It's just a proven fact. And when you lose, they're not going to write nice things unless they're the athletic or Nesson talking about the aforementioned teams I've already discussed in this podcast. So to me, Leon was petulant. Him and Connor have been petulant during games. They've been distancing, distancing themselves from the team. This is on them. A lot of it is on them. Has your have your teammates been borderline awful this season? Yes. Yes. And if you look at statistically, which let's do it right now, because we can, you know, you'd look at it and say, well, these guys have been great. And you know what they have? They played really good. You know, at times, beginning of the season was dry saddle couldn't be stopped. But Dry Settles got 54 points. That's second most in the NHL. Connor McDavid's got 53 points. That's third most in the NHL. But let's look. Alex Ovechkin's first. His team is in a playoff spot. Hubert O, 53, best team in hockey. Nazem Kadri, playoff spot, fifth. Stamkos, playoff spot, sixth. Rantanen, playoff spot, um, seventh. Meyer is right on the cut line. Marshan, playoff spot. Goodrow, playoff spot. Hedman, Matthews, Yossi, McKinnon. I'm not going to go on. But guys don't have as many points as them, but their team are in a position to win. And do they have better a, a better supporting cast? Yes, I, I'll fully admit that. But it's also, you guys need to help pick up the other guys because you distancing yourself. You guys being special, being so pissed off, it cannot create a great environment in that locker room. So to me, Edmonton, the turnaround is going to be led by Dry Saddle and McDavid. And ultimately, it will come from them getting points in the bucket load, but also how you present yourself, how you how you look going onto the ice is also really, really important. And to me so far, they've acted lately like teenage boys. And you those guys in the locker room have no confidence right now. You showing that you have no confidence in them is not going to help and it's not going to help you win. And oh Florida lost last night, which I said is a rarity. It's a headline in and of itself. But now you got Florida at home tomorrow night. So you've won two of your last 10. You've been stinking it up. You're negative. Everything, sky's falling. Well, now you got Florida coming in. So gear up because you got a great team coming to your building. And you got it, you got to be ready for this. And as we're talking here, uh, there's actually some breaking news. Uh, Sportsnet has just uh, made uh, amendments to their schedule. So basically, uh, if you, you know, the last month, a lot of games have been postponed primarily for Canadian teams because there haven't been any fans in the stands. There hasn't been any news if there are going to be, but there's going to be games during the, what was going to be the Olympic break. So on Sportsnet, uh, January 31st, New Jersey at Toronto, that's a Monday. Monday, February 7th, you got Carolina at Toronto, New Jersey at Ottawa, hometown hockey, Chicago at Edmonton, uh, Wednesday night hockey, Saturday, Columbus at Montreal. Uh, it's a hometown hockey day. Um, or my, that might be a home, yeah, hometown hockey. Uh, Toronto at Vancouver on the 12th. So you got a bunch of rescheduled games uh, coming down the pike. Uh, most of them are in Canadian cities, so you're starting to see games be rescheduled. Toronto at Montreal, Monday, February 21st. Um, so games are being rescheduled here, um, and you knew that was going to happen. There's going to be games all through February. Again, they're supposed to, they're thinking about the Olympics. Uh, nothing is happening for the Olympics, so you're. I think we'll see more games. Uh, I think the NHL is supposed to come up with a, a full schedule today. 
for the month of February and, and moving on with cancel games and during that time slot. So uh, I think we'll see that news come in today, but that was the latest on sports, not just with Canadian teams games uh, when it, you know, down, down the line here. So um, like I said, Toronto will be playing on uh, a week from a week from Monday, I believe, or uh, yeah, the 31st, a week from week from Monday, they'll be playing that night now against New Jersey. So there's going to be more and more games coming in. So keep your eyes out uh, for that because there'll be games all through February uh, that coincide with the Olympics and obviously coincide with, um, with, with the uh, national basketball association, their all-star game, the all-star game is still a go in the NHL. I'll save that rant as we get closer to the all-star game, you know, I won't fit that one into today's show. Cause that, that that one's just you know it's a, it's a yearly thing for me just to get that one off my chest but um you know i, I won't uh, i won't bore you with, with that one today but tonight we got coyotes devils in the nhl that's a people just are lining up for that game i'll probably watch some of it but you got maple Leafs rangers uh that should be an interesting one no jake muzzin for toronto um again they continue to play on, on the road but one thing I do think this provides for Toronto is another measuring stick game. Uh, you know, they beat Vegas last week after giving up a 3-1 lead. They gave a 4-1 lead to Colorado. They had this, uh, you know, they top, you know, they played St. Louis on Saturday where they really only won the game because Jordan Bennington was worse than Jack Campbell on that particular night. But um, I think this, with Muzzin being out with a concussion, I think this is an opportunity for Timothy Lilligren. And I've said this for a while and I don't know why he's not playing night in night out because, you know, I had my doubts he'd ever make the NHL. It took a long time. I think the process was a lot longer than it needed to be, but he's been a healthy scratch right before Christmas. And I'm looking at the team and I'm like, okay, Muzzin's out. So he's going to have to play. Alex Biego is going to have to draw in because they have another, they have a hall is in COVID protocol, but more than that, Timothy Lilligren is a better player than Travis Dermott. And I, I think Sandine, he's a lock to play every night, but Lilligren should be right there as well because Dermott, you know what Dermott's ceiling is. And I don't think Lilligren is going to be a top line defenseman in the NHL, but I do think he makes less stupid decisions than Travis Dermott. Travis, Dim, Travis Dermott's like a pinball machine. He, he gets it and he just the puck goes to the opposite side of the ice and just bang, crash, bang, crash. And more often than not, Travis Dermott will make a play where the puck ends up on the opposing team's stick and it's in the back of the net. See game six last year. Timothy Lilligren has some size. He has some, he has some grit to his game as does Sandine. And I, those two would just be playing night in, night out for me. It wouldn't be, I, I just like the two of them a hell of a lot more than I like, um, then I like uh, Travis Dermott personally, and Dermott is a good player. He's a nice guy to fill on the bench, but to me, he's not an NHL defenseman that you'd want night in, night out. I do think they need to improve their defense core as, as we move forward here, but Lilligren is an important guy. They'll play the Rangers who, you know, they have 54 points. Maple Leafs have 51. Uh, they do not in the same division, but New York has played 39 games. Toronto's only played 36, so they do have some games in hand. But like I said, it's a good litmus test. These two teams have played tight games so far this year. The first meeting of the season, Igor Shesterkin was unbelievable in Toronto, making 50-plus saves. They come away with the two points. And then uh, Jack Campbell was great when they played in New York earlier this year. But you know, you're going to see some great players tonight. you got uh, Adam Fox, who just won the Norris Trophy. You obviously got Austin Matthews, who continues to score at a rapid pace. Shesterkin, and um, and you have Jack Campbell. I think Shesterkin, I believe he got sent to the All-Star game. If he didn't, he, he should have. But you, you got Chris Kreider, who's got 24 goals. you got Matthews, who's got 25. So a lot of interesting storylines tonight in two, two teams that – you know, play really differently, even though they're both very good teams. I think Toronto is improved on their girth, on their toughness, but obviously uh, New York lost Sammy Blay to the PK Subban Slewfoot this year, but you still have Ryan Reeves, Ryan, Ryan Lindgren on the back end is a tough customer. So it should be an entertaining game this evening in, uh, in the Big Apple. 
So look, look forward to that one. I mean, also just to point out this week, I mean, Timo Meyer scored five goals on Monday on Martin Luther King day, you know, kudos to him, the former Halifax Moosehead, you know, these, the Swiss superstar for the San Jose Sharks. Um, but, you know, scoring five goals in only 11 minutes and 36 seconds of ice time when he got those two, when he got those five goals, what an impressive feat. You know, he's an elite goal scorer. He just continues to, to improve year over year in San Jose. And it's to guys like him and Thomas Hurdle, who are really the, the next wave of player that have kept San Jose in it this season. You know, they, they are not a great team. But, you know, you look at this team, James Reimer's actually been pretty good for them, uh, you know, despite he, he's got his problems, but he's been pretty good. Uh, Carlson had a decent year, even I'm not a, still not a huge fan, but Hurdle's got 35 points in 40 games. That'll work. You know, he's I, I love Thomas Hurdle. I mean, I, I mentioned, you know, they still have older guys, but Timo Meyer, he's got uh, 45 points in 35 games that that'll work. You know, that, that, that's, that's awesome. So they, two, those two guys have really been the, the key cogs to, to this team. Brent Burns, he's got 27 points in 40. He still contributes offensively, but they rely a lot on these guys to, to produce these two guys in particular. And, you know, Couture, he's, ha he's having a decent season as well. So they're still getting production from him. But it's a good story to see San Jose and, and uh, Timo Meyer after, you know, the years of Thornton and Marlowe and this team being consistent. They have young players on the horizon and that are – and Hurdle, you know, is more of a veteran now. And he's, he's consistent year in, year out. For me, he's a really good player. But, um, you know, good to see from these guys what they're doing and obviously the great – uh, the great individual success that they're having in San Jose. Um, let's go to Vegas here for a second when it comes to the Las Vegas Raiders. And on Monday night, they fired their GM, Mike Mayock. And it was interesting because we know that they have, you know, they have a kind of a, a placeholder coach right now, potentially because Rick Passaccia, he took over. Um, for John Gruden, who was fired, uh, you know, cut, you might say, uh, for, for, you know, his misogynistic, for his racist, uh, you know, he, what he's done, uh, what he, what he, in his emails and kind of just his overall being. And when he was hired three years ago, Mike Mayock was the GM. And Mike Mayock, prior to going to Vegas, worked at the NFL Network he was a draft guru and, you know, the team hasn't exactly been great on drafts. Uh, if we look through Mike Mayock's tenure, um, three first round picks were Cleveland Farrell. Cleveland Farrell was a healthy scratch this past week. He did not play. Josh Jacobs, it's a good running back, but he's been injury prone. And I don't like drafting running backs in the first round myself. Jonathan Abram, hit or miss. He's miss, missed an entire season with Achilles tear. Um, you know, they did get a great edge rusher, Max Crosby, in the fourth round. But, uh, you know, there's some, there's some, there's a lot of these drafts that didn't go well. You know, they got Hunter Renthrow in the, in the, in the fifth round. That was a great pick. Damon Arnett, they took, was a 19th overall pick in the 2020 draft. He's cut. He was on, uh, he was on social media showing that he had it was guns and he was threatening to kill someone. He's not on the roster. Henry Ruggs the third, 12th overall pick of that same class, same season, was released because if you remember, he was drinking and driving. He hit a woman, uh, he hit a car with a woman and a and her her feline inside of it. Both did not make it. So he's he's now in jail. Uh, so that tells you Alex Leatherwood. Uh, you know, he had to switch to guard this season. He was uh, an offensive tackle. So that didn't exactly go well. So basically what I'm telling you is, you know, they got better through free agency. You know, guys like uh, Zay Jones, Deshaun Jackson, Yannick Ngakwe, Casey Hayward, who, who was great this year. But the draft guru was not great. But I'm okay with Mike Mayock, even though they made, made the playoffs, because his drafts haven't exactly been fantastic. So if he has to go, I'm fine with that. But I will lay my sword here. Rick Bisaccia should be given the head coaching job by the Las Vegas Raiders. And it's for a couple of reasons. 
number one, if you haven't seen the video of him talking to Zay Jones, I recommend you go find it on YouTube. He, you know, he talks about how you're going to go in there and make a big play. And he's like, just stay patient. They stay patient. He catches a touchdown and they share this really, really cool moment where Zay Jones says, you're doing a hell of a job. He, he whispers in his coach's ear and Basaccia whispers back, you're doing, you're doing a damn good job too. And you just saw this team, how they wanted to win for Basaccia. He's been their special teams coach. He's followed uh, John Gruden around, but this team shouldn't have made the playoffs. They shouldn't have had the, the willpower and the fight to say, you know what? We're going to overcome all, we're going to overcome three different guys, three different starters this year, get cut for other reasons other than their play. And Der Derek Carr deserves a lot of the credit for that because he's the leader of this team. But Basaccia is the coach. He kept them on task. And you could argue if they didn't get a phony whistle against Cincinnati, maybe that game goes to overtime. Who knows? But he deserves this opportunity. And I, I get the, the, the position of, well, he's likely going to get fired next year, you know, because he's a coach that's never been a head coach. And I understand that, you know, that, that, moniker of what's happened in the history of the NFL but you also have to reward a guy who got his team to the playoffs when he shouldn't have when he overcame a lot of obstacles you know this team was in self-destruction mode but also you gotta think this team has two players that were former addicts on the team and Darren Waller and Max Crosby and Waller was over with an injury and he, he came out and said you know I, it was a couple of dark days where I really thought of going back to cocaine but Rick Basaccia helped him through it he was there for his rehabs he helped him get back it's one thing to have the locker room which he does I don't know about the X's and O's I don't know if he's a great play caller I don't know if he but to get a team motivated and want to play be ready to play is something that can't be overlooked as well you look at like Mike McCarthy in Dallas he they don't want to play for him he's not they're not fired up from Mike McCarthy. They don't have that same feeling. Rick Basaccia had that locker room feeling like we want to do this for Rich. You know, he's our coach now. And I think it would be such, you've already got rid of the GM. They're going to interview a head coach on Friday. I would draw Mayo, who was the inside linebackers coach for the New England Patriots last season. He's never been a head coach. He's only, he's another inside linebackers coach. And he's getting a lot of play around the league. He's interviewed in Houston. He's interviewed in Chicago. He's interviewed in Miami. So, you know, he's getting a lot of push. He's another, you know, Belichick disciple, if you will, that might get another job. But to no, and no, uh, Drod Mayo was a former player. He won a Super Bowl and he might be a great coach. I also think it's great that he's an African American because there's only one black head coach employed in the NFL right now, if you can believe it. But, and it's not that hard to believe, but Rick Basaccia deserves this. He should not be replaced following what he accomplished last year for a guy that's never been a head coach in Gerard Mayo. That has been an inside linebackers coach, but hasn't really shown anything. And I'm fine if Gerard Mayo gets a job because Mike Tomlin was a relative unknown and he turned into a great coach. You know, he turned into a guy who hasn't missed the, hasn't had a, a, a sub 500 record in 15 seasons. May, maybe Gerard Mayo is that next story, but don't Vegas, don't be the organization that does it. Allow Houston to pick up Gerard Mayo. Maybe that is a great hire for them because they have a lot of different things they need to work through. Deshaun Watson, it's reported again yesterday. It's been reported all year, but he's likely done with the organization. Um, they got a high pick in the draft. What do they do with that? So they, you know, do they keep Davis Mills as their quarterback next season? I mean, there's a lot to be decided, but for Vegas, Rick Basaccia got you to the playoffs. John Gruden, the, the genius that you hired and gave a 10 year, a hundred million dollar contract. Couldn't do that. He never did that in, in Vegas. In his second tenure, he never got, never got you to the playoffs. And maybe you could argue he would have got them there this year, but, I don't think so. Basaccia's effect, his morale, his just his his place, just his presence on this team helped get the Raiders to the postseason. And, you know, Mark Davis, 
respect that you got to the playoffs and hope you can build on this into next season. You have some really good players. Trayvon Mulrig is a rookie. I think he's really good. I like Derek Carr more than most people. Zay Jones makes tough catches. You have one of the best tight ends in football. You know, you got to hope that your offensive line can improve. Leatherwood, who you took in the first round, can imp- he played at Alabama, but can he get better? Um, you know, defensively, you, you had your struggles this year, but, you know, Gus Bradley is a good defensive coordinator. Maybe he can turn it around. So I just think let another team get rich, get draw Mayo, but Rick Basaccia deserves the opportunity to coach this team next season. It's, it's one thing to put lip service to it. He earned it. He beat the chargers in the last game of the season. He beat the Colts in the second last game. They were written off, including by me, myself included. And they got to the playoffs. They were in the game to the bitter end against Cincinnati. He deserves a ton of credit for what he did. And he deserves a job for next season at the, at the bare minimum. We'll see what they do, but I think Rick Passaccia deserves an opportunity to coach this team moving forward. And obviously the divisional playoff games, they will, uh, there are as fall uh, Saturday at five 30. It is Cincinnati headed to play the one seed Tennessee um, Saturday, nine 15. You have San Francisco heading to Lambeau to play the 49ers. That's the ninth meeting between the two teams that is tied for the most in the history of the NFL Sunday, four o'clock. You have LA who beat Arizona Monday night. They will go to play the uh, defending Super Bowl champions, the Buccaneers. And Sunday will be finished by a 7.30 start between the Buffalo Bills and Kansas City Chiefs, a rematch of last year's AFC championship game. Um, we'll get into, I'll get into more of this throughout the week, more tomorrow and obviously Friday with Matt Wright uh, as, we, as we dive into uh, the matchups, the players. But I will say just uh, as a quick thought, I do think I had the Bucks repeating at the beginning of the season. I think if they're going to lose a game, if they're not going to, you know, it's one thing to say, well, of course, if they lose this week, they're not going to the Super Bowl. But I think if the Bucks are going to get beaten by a team, it's going to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So it's going to be the Los Angeles Rams. And it will be this weekend because if they win this weekend, I don't believe that they're going to lose to Green Bay. They just match up well with that team. Tom Brady beats Aaron Rodgers. I think they'll beat San Francisco. And then in the AFC, who knows? But, I mean, they played well against Kansas City last year. We'll see what happens there. But I, I just have this feeling that if they're going, and I'll talk about more about why I, I think that, but I think if they're going to lose, it will be to the Los Angeles Rams. A lot of it has to do with their defensive makeup, but that's, that's, my, that's my thought heading in, and we'll talk about this more as we go through the week. Australian Open uh, is, uh, is alive, and it's on down under. Obviously, no Novak Djokovic, but we have seen some entertaining games. Uh, Felix Felix Ogier Aliasim of Canada had a five-set win over a Finnish man on day two. Denis Shapovalov had to, had to come from two sets to one down last night to get to uh, round three. He'll play American Taylor Fritz, who's number 22 in the world, um, tomorrow night. So he'll he'll battle to get into the, to the round of 16. But we have seen some upsets. Leila Annie Fernandez, the Canadian who made the, Aust- the U.S. Open final out the first round. Coco Goff, the young uh, American, is was out in the first round. But in the men's draw, nothing too crazy yet. Uh, you, uh, Nadal's been, been cruising. Um, Sissy Poss uh, has played well. I mentioned Shavavala, Fraley Opelka is through. Berrettini, the number seven seed, is through. Um, but, you know, interesting matches uh, this evening. You've got, and probably the most interesting, I think will be the most entertaining match. You have Daniel Medvedev, the number two seed, really the number one seed at this event because uh, there's no Djokovic. But he'll be playing Aussie Nick Kyrgios. And Kyrgios is one of, if not the most talented tennis players on tour. But the fact that he doesn't win is because it's his own self-inflicted wounds. It's his own head. He makes poor decisions. He he makes bad, he's, he's just, he's not a smart tennis player. And he, he loses it between matches. He'll start throwing his rackets. And, you know, Medved is a very cool, calm, and collected guy. So I'm interested to see how that matchup goes tonight. But two very good tennis players when they're at the top of their game. 
that's a 4 a.m. start to so maybe hit the PVR if you uh, need a couple more hours of, of sleep. Uh, Yannick Sinner, Steve Johnson will meet tonight. That'll be a, a good matchup. Uh, Felix will meet uh, Alejandro Davidic Fakina, who uh, is a better clay court player. So I expect Felix to get through. On the women's side of things, uh, you know, Ash Barty's been, been first two matches, just no problem whatsoever. Naomi Osaka, it looks like those two may be in a, a semifinal uh, or a quarterfinal type matchup, which would be fantastic. Osaka winning this event last year. And Ash Barty, being Australian, has never won her home event. So we'll see what happens here. But tonight you got Simona Halep's on court, Emma Raducanu, the uh, U.S. Open uh women's champion, obviously only 19 years old. She took three sets to win round one, but she got through it. Um, Arnia Sabalenka, the number two seed. And uh, so some interesting matchups tonight at, at the Aussie Open. We got a full slate of NBA games tonight. And um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting week. Uh, I was supposed to podcast with Harrison Schutenbeld and uh, Seamus Fillmore tonight, but Fortunately, uh, some things came up on Harrison's end, so we'll have to reschedule and do that down the line. But I'll be back tomorrow. I'll recap the lease game, whatever else news that comes down the pike uh, this evening and the other sports news, and I'll start to preview the, um, the NFL games this coming weekend as well. So thank you guys all for tuning in, to, uh, tuning in today. Have a great rest of your Wednesday, and as always, we'll talk soon.